Well, I'm guessing that's my cue to go, guys. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to World Audio Day. My name's Don Robinson. It gives me a great pleasure to host this session. Uh, th for the next hour, we're going to be looking at the history of internet radio. And I have some spectacular panelists to uh, join me and help me uh, talk through what's nearly three decades, by my estimation, uh, of, uh, of the technologies that come together to make uh, internet radio. So I'm going to go along my speaker list and uh, introduce the panel first of all. So first up, we've got Paul. Paul, how are you doing? Doing well. Thank you, Dom. Excellent. So we've got Paul Rizendel. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Paul, and uh, what your interests are in internet radio. Sure. Well, I've been I come to it through uh, non-commercial radio, principally community radio and college radio in the United States. I've been involved in some form for 30 years now. And then in the 90s, uh, you know, when uh, it just became possible to get audio and video on the internet, that's when I got interested and started uh, using it, trying to get community radio stations on the air, but also I was working academically at the University of Illinois, trying to get foreign language services for students online. And that's uh, something I did as a career for a good 15 years at the same time, working in community radio, working at college radio up at WNUR in uh, Northwestern University outside of Chicago uh, in Illinois. And then, you know, for the last 10 years, I've been writing for radiosurvivor.com along with uh, three other colleagues where we cover the worlds of, of college and independent radio. But we, we focus a lot on truly grassroots radio, whether it's broadcast, whether it's podcast, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, internet, and really try to highlight these things. So I've always kind of keep my finger on the pulse. And professionally now, I work in podcasting. I work for Stitcher, and I work on, on the side of selling ads on podcasts, uh, working in market research for a Stitcher, where I've been for uh, six years. Perfect. Well, we're going to come back to that for sure. And now, right, our next guest uh, possibly needs no introduction for certainly those who've uh, been involved in streaming for any length of time. But Rob, Rob Glazer, are you out there? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, Dom, it's great to be uh, with you for me this morning, for you this evening. Excellent. Give us a short, uh, give us a short introduction. If you not that you need much of an introduction, but give us a short introduction to your space, and uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll go into some details a little later on. The timing of this event is fantastic. It was uh, 25 uh, years ago, just this past week, where when we introduced Real Audio, which was the internet's first uh, commercial streaming platform, streaming audio platform, uh, and uh, many people started doing internet radio literally when we launched. That first version was designed, uh, it was on demand, um, voice only, but that didn't stop people from trying to do everything they possibly could to make the most of the technology we introduced live and music capabilities starting about uh, six months later after that. Uh, and so it's been a wild ride working in uh, partnership with uh, some incredible uh, innovators and pioneers, including the folks on this panel, to uh, make the internet radio come alive. It's been a fantastic journey and a great ride and uh, having a lot of fun to this day. No, it's a great pleasure to have you on, Rob. Thanks for joining us. So, and uh, Andrew, now we haven't met before, Andrew, but uh, I think we share a common love in this uh, in this uh, journey of the history of the internet. So, Andrew, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, yeah. So, my name's uh, Andrew Bottomley, and I am an assistant professor of media studies at SUNY Oneonta, so State, State University of New York. Um, I teach a whole range of media classes, but my kind of specialty and my main interest that, that brings me here today is, um, is audio storytelling and podcasting and, and radio histories. So I'm a trained media historian, um, and so I study the whole uh, history of radio um, from its origins, but particularly my focus is the history of internet radio, radio um, and digital radio and um, I have a book that's about to come out called Sound Streams, A Cultural History of Radio Internet Convergence. It's coming out in just a couple of months. That traces this history uh, from the early years of the, of the, of the 1990s and, and 1993 about um, up through more or less the present day, looking at the development of streaming audio as well as the development of podcasting and particularly the cultures of, you know, who was doing uh, you know, internet radio early on, who was doing podcasting early on, why were they interested in inventing these technologies and, you know, broadcasting on the internet and so on. Perfect, Andrew, thank you. And uh, you've already been with us, Dane, uh, for a session that opened uh, the day today. But Dane, tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Oh, well, yeah, thanks, Don. Um, yes, I'm Dane Street, I'm co founder and managing director of Sharpstream. Um, we are a, a CDM for audio um, that allows our large uh, enterprise customers to distribute, monetize, and report their content online. Um, I very, first got into thing, the uh, audio streaming um, space probably back in yeah 2007, uh, and back then it was taking a hefty desktop PC into the middle of a field and doing a live contribution for an internet stream back then. And uh, even though I was in a muddy field um, for I think 14 hours of a miserable day, uh, I still got hooked onto the idea that um, I could go there and, and distribute some content out of the net. It was amazing. So that's the panel, guys. We've got um, for the next uh, 50 minutes, and if you've got any questions or uh, things you'd like to, like to put to the panel, do drop them, drop them into the Q&A button, which you'll find at the bottom of the interface here. Uh, very happy to uh, break out and uh, look at Q uh, questions that the uh, audience are particularly interested in focusing on. But uh, what I wanted to do, I'm slightly daunted by having Andrew on the panel, actually, because I, one of the reasons I brought this panel together was a couple of uh, years ago for a magazine I write for, uh, called streaming media. Uh, I, I volunteered to write a history of uh, internet radio. Uh, it, it had been spawned uh, from a podcast I'd done with Paul and Dane on it, uh, where we started talking a lot about internet radio and the evolution of it. Uh, and I thought this was going to be a short article, but after talking to Paul, Rob, and Dane, and a few other dignitaries in the space, the article actually ended up having to be split into two and published across two editions because there's an awful lot of people who are very passionate about this space. But the one thing I'd like to put to each of the panel members, first of all, is what do you call internet radio? What, how do we define what is internet radio? Because I think it's a good opener, it'll help contextualize the panel. So I'm going to sweep across the panel again in the same order that we introduced, uh, and just to get some insights of, of what you each think. So Paul, what, what does internet radio mean to you? Oh, on the hot seat already. Okay. Yeah. Think fast. I mean, I think if I think if I go back to the 90s, when I clicked on my first real audio stream, uh, you know, and was blown away that it, over my 14.4 modem that I could hear, uh, you know, this live radio from around the world. I mean, it's effectively that, right? It's effectively getting, you know, a live radio stream over the internet. And, and a live, I think, is, is pretty important, although with, in this day and age, I think, you know, on demand and and streaming, live streaming are, are sort of, you know, coming together in, in our usage in, our, in the popular mind, right? So, I mean, that includes podcasting, which also, also, you know, sort of includes being able to listen to this morning's drive time radio show on demand, right? And the, the lines are, are get, get thinner and thinner between these different things. But ultimately, for me, it was and, and continues to be the ability to tune in to just about any radio station anywhere on earth that's near an internet connection and experience live radio as if I were there. Perfect. Rob, you've probably been exposed to quite a few different uh, models and paradigms around internet radio. Well, what does internet radio mean to you today? Well, I would I would say my my, my view is, uh, is similar to Paul's. I, I would just say that I probably don't differentiate uh, whether it's live or on demand, because to me, the, the magic is that you as a broadcaster can put your content on it and reach a global audience. And you as a listener can... Uh, uh, you turn on your uh, internet enabled device, which in the beginning was you know computers, PCs and Macs, and now is almost anything, uh, and that you could have access to any stream originating uh, that's available openly anywhere in the world. So to me, that was the magic when we first started the uh, commercial streaming revolution in 95 was that you could literally, anybody could be a broadcaster and anybody could, uh, could listen to anything from anywhere in the world. Now, of course, there's all kinds of impediments that come over time, people put up paywalls for business models, sensors try to block things. And, you know, there's, you know, famous like the Great Firewall of China and other limitations. But that general notion of the uh, unlimited amount of uh, access, uh, the unlimited global reach, those to me are the foundational fundamental things about what makes internet radio so magical. Perfect. And Andrew, you, you, you've been investigating the history of internet radio. What, what, what does internet radio as a term mean to you? Uh, um... So yeah, I actually, in a lot of ways, I guess, avoid putting um, a hard definition on these things. Um, I, I, as someone who studies the history of radio and kind of taking the long view of, of uh, radio and all its many iterations, right? Like many, radio comes in many different forms. Um, I try not to put too constrictive of a definition 
Um, in particular, I tend to try to avoid ones that have um, are too techn technologically focused because I think then there, you end up in a situation where there's like sort of like you get a this is radio, this isn't radio, or this is internet radio, this isn't. Um, but I think as as was you know echoed in, in the previous comments, I really think about what I talk about as sociability and the real thing about internet radio. I mean, there is something about liveness that's important and something about publicness that's important. Like, you know, it's that you're putting it out there for a perceived audience, even if it's an audience of just a few or a few million, um, that it's directed at, you know, rather, so it's not just turning a microphone on to like your, you know, to an ambient environment or whatever. Um, it's, it's crafted in a way. Um, but that can mean a whole lot of things. So I, I really focus on like what it is that people are trying to achieve with radio and that idea of kind of the social desire to kind of come together, that human need for kind of companionship and community and, uh, and radio and internet radio in particular as being a way of gathering people together. Um, particularly you think about the, you know, the internet, how vast and expansive it is, like internet radio and like you think about the stream as a way of bringing together a group of people to share a common, you know, interest or a common topic or a common bond. Perfect. And Dane, and I'm sure it means a, a livelihood to you, but uh, among, uh, beyond a livelihood, what does internet radio mean? It, it, yeah, obviously it is. Um, I just, yeah, not too much to add on, on those comments other than, you know, for me it really is about the live shared experience. Um, whether you want to call that radio or just listening to IP um, audio uh, in one way or another, um, I think is, is the ultimate is the ultimate thing. Um, with social media networks and things coming up in the last uh, last 10 months, obviously, uh, 10 years, that's obviously driven, um, you know, on-demand audio experiences. And I think that has started to blend what is live and what is on-demand. I don't think it really matters so much. And obviously we do that with um, with our side project of the TTNS. Indeed. Perfect. So, um, Andrew, I'm going to jump around a little bit here. Andrew, I wanted to go, um, come to you next. For, for those that are listening that are not particularly technical, don't be afraid about the next 10 minutes. Uh, we will come back to the societal and the content uh, side of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, and the impacts of uh, internet radio. But just, uh, Andrew, in particular, I, I wanted to go back to where you see, you know, after your research for your book, where you see the sort of starting point for the technologies. Because I, I, in, my, um, in my streaming media article, I, I, I certainly... Uh, uh, came to my own view on those, but I've met half a dozen people with different views of where internet radio was born. And I, I will in a minute come to you, Rob. Um, but Andrew, I want to I want to I want to see what you found on your sort of probably more academic research than mine was. Where, where does where does internet radio begin for you? No, I, I think I think actually, you know, I was just I've read your article and I've re I just was just rereading it, and I think we agree on a lot of the main starting points. Um, you know, of course, there's sort of, you know, there's some technical distinctions between sort of whether it's streaming or non-streaming. Um, but, you know, I, I see the, the, the kind of the main starting point of what we can call internet radio being Carl Malamud and the Internet Multicasting Service or Internet Talk Radio. Um, so that's March, uh, March 1993 was when he started that service, although it, it, it was his initial um, broadcasts were actually what we would probably call podcasts. They were on-demand oh, audio. Yeah. Um, they were on-demand audio using .au files distributed over FTP networks and uh, people found ways to sort of stream them. Uh, you know, they download the files and then kind of rebroadcast them. Uh, and then he was using the, you know, multicasting and the M-Bone for certain special events. And um, I think it was um, it was also in, in 1993, they did a broadcast of the NPR Science Friday program that uh, was broadcast over the radio, but also over the, it was multicast using the M-Bone that Malamud was the guest and he set it up for them. That was probably the first live multicast radio on the internet. Yeah, I, I, I uh, was probably nitpicking to go back, and I think I slightly annoyed Carl when I was talking to him to, to talk to um, some of the guys from UCL uh, uh, who yeah. had been running a project called MICE. And so in the academic circles and on M-Bone, uh, I think Dave Hayes, who had accidentally played right. some jazz over the, uh, the M-Bone backbone, 
uh, probably does pip Carl to the post for the internet radio, but it certainly wasn't a produced uh, piece until he got uh, Radio Free Bat going uh, yeah. in late, in sort of about the same time as uh, as Carl. So I think there's yeah, some, there, were... there, there were some contenders for the crown. Oh no, there are a number of people experimenting with like audio conferencing tools and things, and and uh, you know particularly related to the um, you know the the IETF and and so. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I said, I'm, I'm a cultural historian. So like, you know, first are always, people love to fight about first. I, I, what I yeah. find exciting, <laughs> what I find exciting though, is that there were quite a number of people and particularly when you get, you know, a, a, a year or two down the road to when, you know, when, when real audio came around and, and there were a number of other people, um, particularly like with college radio stations in the United States playing around with simulcasting, what you get is a lot of, people who all have sort of the same idea. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, Rob's, uh, uh, you know, it, version of that idea was, 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 you know, probably the real groundbreaking moment. Um, but there were a lot of people who were like thinking the same thought and um, trying to, you know, move that technology forward to achieve similar goals. And that's what I find really exciting is that, th that there was something in the air, if you will. And, you know, yeah. we could, we could poke around and look at, you know, who was doing this or that first, but, um, you know, I think what's exciting is that, you know, in terms of streaming, that audio was, was, was the starting point for this vast thing of streaming media. And people were trying quite a few different things early on using a number of different tools and protocols. I think one of the amazing things about Carl's uh, sessions are the, are the guests he had on his uh, first shows, you know, Vince Surf, and uh, there were some just incredible guests that he had, who, even though it was a small sort of academic project those people yeah. are now uh you know some of the the, the very forefathers of uh, of what went on with internet so i don't think we can uh, i don't think we can avoid yeah. moving on to robert uh, at this point rob you you were there in fact you have an incredible history in uh in in, in microsoft before that and uh your your career came from an an era which uh, I wish I'd been ten years older and been there to be honest because it was ju it just sounds like an amazing place to be. Tell us a little bit about how how it all came to become real. Well, I, I feel uh, super lucky to have been at the right place at the right time uh, a few different times in my life. It's a it's a very uh, uh, fortunate thing to to be at a place where you're kind of. Uh, have the right uh, background and the right relationships and to, to know about things. Uh, so for me, uh, the connection to uh, uh, starting what became uh, Real Networks and launching Real Audio uh, has its origin uh, actually with the uh, uh, with with the sort of the techno utopian side of the internet. So Mitch Kapor, the founder of Lotus, the spreadsheet company, who's also the founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, became a good friend and kind of a mentor. Mitch is about uh, 10 years older than me. And Mitch invited me in the spring of 1993 to get on the board of his nonprofit, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And at the time, I'd spent 10 years at Microsoft, had an incredible run, uh, had left, technically was on leave, but I was pretty sure I wasn't going to come back. So I uh, remember going to the first EFF uh, board meeting I was invited to in Austin, Texas, uh, in uh, late May, I think, of 1993. And uh, met meet a number of, uh, of amazing people. Uh, in addition to Mitch, uh, he's was great at collecting sort of uh, uh, people who are very forward thinking. And one of the guys there, I named Dave Farber, who really was one of the uh, pioneers of the internet. Uh, you know, Vint Cerf gets corporate credit. Dave Farber, who was a professor uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon and, and a few other uh, universities, was was right there at the at the founding of it. And Dave uh, said, "Hey, do you guys want to see this mosaic thing?" So he had gotten a pre-beta of uh, NCSA Mosaic that was being worked on at the University of Illinois. And we all gathered around and he showed it to us. And to me, it was like, literally, I just saw a time machine and I saw the future. Uh, that was not the first browser. You know, the, 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 the uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee had invented uh, the web browser earlier on, but it was the first browser that was sort of on a commercial path. It ran on Macintosh with Windows computers. Uh, they created the image tag. So you could actually see images embedded in web pages. It wasn't just uh, text. Uh, and so I saw that and I left there blown away. And I had the thought um, probably days after that, but pretty much after that, like, wow, what if we could do the same thing for audio and video uh, that, uh, that they're doing uh, with that uh, NCSA web browser for, for text and still images. So I pulled a team together. Uh, fortunately, I had a background that was you know, quite aligned with that. I had done multimedia at Microsoft, uh, computer networking at Microsoft, application software, 
So I had a, 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 a product background and somewhat of a technical background. Uh, I have a degree in computer science, although I'm, I'm not a, a programmer actively and haven't been for many years, but kind of know what questions to ask. And so I pulled together a phenomenal expert in audio compression, a uh, phenomenal expert in uh, internet protocols. He was actually uh, running the FAQ for WWW on Usenet. So uh, just a guy, used to, and I started corresponding, a guy called Tom Boutel, uh, who was uh, working for Cold Springs Labs in uh, upstate, uh, in, a, in Long Island in New York, and just was a web guru. So he, he was our first web guru and uh, brought in some folks I knew from Microsoft who were Windows experts and put together a, a mini team to create a prototype of what became Real Audio. And at the time, I too was inspired by people like Carl Malamud. And, you know, I, I saw what Carl was doing uh, with his, uh, his downloads, which were big honking, you know, uh, .au files, which needed broadband to get access to. But you could kind of, you know, if you squinted, you could kind of see the future. Uh, and so I had this idea of, so, you know, what if we could actually figure out a, a set of technologies to make that possible, make it possible so that literally, uh, as, uh, as, as Paul described, you could just click on your on your 14.4 modem, click on a link and the audio would just start playing. How magical would that be? And so we, we sort of figured out how to do it, uh, ended up bringing in a, a, a phenomenal leader of engineering who was a guy who was a, a former colleague at Microsoft, a guy called Phil Barrett, who was not literally my co-founder because he came on about uh, about seven or eight months later, but he, he was somebody who I knew could build a, a very robust, technically scalable uh, system. Uh, and so under a, a group of people's leadership, including Phil's, uh, we built the prototype for what became Real Audio, uh, and then, as I said, launched it 25 years ago. So I go much further into the how we got from here to there, but that's sort of the Reader's Digest version, introduced to the World Wide Web in 93 by uh, uh, Dave Farber uh, and some folks at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Thought it was the most exciting thing I'd ever seen, thought it was the future, and uh, you know, put my head down in starting in uh, late 93, early 94 to build what became Real Audio. So was there a passion for audio as you set out with Real uh, as the sort of front runner or was it, was it just that audio was easier to deliver than video and video took a little bit of time to develop? Well, it was, it was both. So in my personal history, um, I've always loved both uh, uh, audio and video and, and radio in particular. I remember growing up as a kid, you know, you'd have this, I uh, uh, grew up in New York and so obviously you had the regular commercial radio stations, but at night, you could get the clear channel signals from pretty far away, sometimes Florida, sometimes even further. Uh, I didn't have a short radio at the time, but I remember being uh, captivated by that. So then when I was in high school, uh, I started a radio station. I had a, uh, I'd been to summer camp and I had a camp counselor who was a DJ at uh, City College Radio and he took me down there and showed me the radio station. I thought, wow, this is cool. What if we started one in my high school? So we started a radio station. We didn't get a low watt license, which could that seem complicated, but we just strung wires uh, from our little room into the cafeteria, into the gym, and a few other places. So we started a, a radio station on the on this in the school campus uh, at, at the high school I went to in New York. Uh, and we we had I was a, a DJ. We had people that did shows, and so I loved radio. Uh, I've always been interested in media, not just radio. And then. When I was in college, I did not go work at the college radio station. That might have been too obvious, I guess. So, but I worked on the college newspaper. I was editorial editor of the, of the student newspaper at the university, uh, and I wrote a column there. So I, I've always been interested in, in media. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then so uh, in my technical work, at, in my work at Microsoft, I was involved in multimedia uh, by passion as well as opportunity. Uh, so when it came time to start uh, uh, real, you could sort of say in a certain way, that I'd try to prepare myself for it for the previous 15 years just by mm -hmm. my passions in life and how they all came together. So when I talk about being lucky, being the right place at the right time, if I hadn't started radio station in high school, would I have had the idea of doing streaming audio? I don't know. Would I have seen the power of audio? A lot of people thought video is the only thing that mattered. And of course, one of the things about video was doing a, a good quality video over 14.4 or even 28.8 or even 56K modems was basically impossible. So rather than try to solve the harder problem, technically, we solved one that we could solve well, created something that worked reliably and scalably, and then got to video a couple of years later. Perfect. Paul, I can see you nodding there. There's lots of things that uh, Rob, uh, Rob, Rob stepped on that triggered you there. Go on, just straight from the top of your head. What, was the, what, what, were, the, uh, what were the things that made you smile there? Well, I mean, you know, it definitely, I mean, taking a love from high school radio, you know, all the way forward is amazing. And, you know, I think I remember 
I mean, I remember seeing Mosaic in 1993. I was at the University of Illinois studying for a graduate degree in like in computational linguistics. So, you know, I have a lot of the same points. And I remember the debut of Real Audio not long thereafter. And I was working with foreign languages. So we set up a, a real server the first moment we could, right? Because it, we were very excited for this opportunity to get students basically out of labs where they're listening to cassettes, right? Or calling in on telephones uh, to listen to their lessons over the phone through this arcane uh, tape-based, uh, you know, phone system. And, and we could see it and we weren't quite there yet because not everyone had computers that would, that would play audio, et cetera. But at that moment, you know, that's when it clicked for me. I said, okay, this is the technology. Uh, and that, you know, and I stopped being a graduate student in linguistics and got into a career in, in online audio and video as a result. Um, at that point, you know, working with within education, but always care to keeping a line in the radio as well. And so it just it brings back all these memories and, and first reading about uh, real audio and saying, wait, now this is possible? It, mm -hmm. it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to really explain what, what a kind of uh, shot in the dark that was for me at the time. So, and this is the question both for yourself, Paul and Andrew. Um, so community, college radio, uh, maybe I interpolate that a, bit, a little bit too much with community radio, um, but they're, they're kind of, we don't really have a college radio scene over here in the UK, but we, we've got community radio scene, uh, uh, restricted service licenses and so on in the traditional radio space. But the internet, of course, allows these communities to exist non-geographically. Um, and how do you guys both see the internet transforms those community radios into being non-geographic? Because I think that's one of the great differentiators that internet radio brings over traditional uh, wat wattage, you know, uh, uh, FM radio or, or radio, radio radio, if you sort of mean, I lost my terms there. But how do you guys, I mean, Andrew, you mentioned that you've been looking at some of the societal impacts and so on. And Paul, I know Paul's um, been very focused on college radio for years. What, what do you think the big uh, changes that internet radio has brought about have been? Andrew, go ahead. You want me to um, I mean, I mean, Paul and, and Jennifer Waits and Radio Survivor are really some of the, the great champions of, of college radio. Um, here in the United States. Um, but, you know, I think when you particularly talking about college radio and smaller kind of campus radio, community radio, if I don't know how much it's changed what those stations sound like or what they broadcast um, in a good way. Um, because I think what's great is about, about the internet and internet radio is that it allows these, what used to be local, what still are local stations that are you know having programming being made by you know college students or other community members talking about what's of interest to them and then particularly what's of interest to them in their communities and in their daily lives. So if you live in San Francisco or you live in Albany, New York, or you you know you live you know um, you know you know in in Cape Town, South Africa, or wherever you are. But now, now where it used to be limited to a very small radius, because at least in the United States, you know, college radio generally doesn't broadcast um, very far, you know, often maybe not more than 10 or 15 miles out, you know, outside of, uh, of the town in which it's, it's, it's originating. Now you can get that signal to the world. And so it allows for um, particularly like diasporic listening, right? You know, people who, you know, maybe they went to, um, you know, the, the City College of New York or whatever, and they can, you know, they, they're, they live in Seattle or they live in London or whatever, and now they can tune in and listen to what's going on at their alma mater. Uh, you know, I, I'm, an, I'm a, New York, a native New Yorker. I live in upstate New York now, but I still listen to WNYC, which is the NPR, you know, uh, radio affiliate in New York City, like all the time, every day. <laughs> That's what I listen to on the internet. I can't listen, I can't get it on an FM radio, but I, I listen to it, you know, nonstop. And even when I lived in Wisconsin or California, I still listen to New York public radio because that was my home. And I knew those, you know, those, those hosts and I, and I knew, and I was really still interested in those issues of what was happening in, you know, New York politics and so on. So I think it, that's what I think is to me the, you know, maybe the, in terms of me thinking about the global span is the way it makes the, rather than having local broadcasters trying to broadcast to a global audience, it's bringing a global audience to the local broadcast. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, that's, that's an important point. And also, you know, there, I think there, there are these, there, there's these kind of two elements. I mean, one is right, that, that technical element of 
being able to essentially grow the geographic boundaries of your broadcast. And one of the first community stations, it was formerly a college station to really embrace uh, internet broadcasting full on was WFMU in Jersey City, uh, New Jersey, which serves the New York market, but it's relatively low wattage, left end of the dial, not easily received, and it's sort of legendary. And, and I grew up in New Jersey and I would like, wanted to listen to it, but I couldn't because it was difficult to receive where I live. And, you know, they've been on record saying, you know, the advent of internet radio really allowed us to get the audience that we really should be getting over the air, just even in the New York, New Jersey area, because folks who lived in basement apartments or, you know, in places where the, where the terrestrial reception wasn't very good, but, but it was plausible, allowed them to reach them. But then I think there's the other half of it, which then there's this influence factor, right? So now WFMU is a station which is much more legendary almost globally because of the fact amongst people who, are, who like a particular type of music, who like interesting underground uh, music because it's on the internet. And then you have stations like a KEXP out of Seattle, a, you know, a non-commercial station with its roots in college radio, which really has an international presence because of the fact that it, it can be on the internet, even though it, it is certainly well loved and listened to in the Seattle region. Now, no matter where you are, you can get it. And it also, you know, it plays with the same network effects of the internet. It, it has now also great influence in the way that, you know, at one point we know we, we thought about Cleveland being the market that broke rock records in the 60s. You know, you can now have stations all over the world bringing new artists to the fore or helping to break artists and music because they're globally networked and globally listenable, right? It's not only the Seattle market, it's now really in a certain way, it, it, the, the, the audience of listeners are unified by interest and, and, you know, and culture of a certain type rather than only the geography, which is, which is really where, where radio had, had been limited to. And I think bringing it to this day, you know, we have a new generation in the United States of low power FM stations, which are very tiny stations operating at like 100 watts. And because of that nature, their, their geographic signal is relatively limited. But internet broadcasting, you know, allows them to really serve their communities uh, much better than they can over the air. And, and there's this real symbiotic relationship, and it's going back and forth, I think, between the radio, where I talk to people, they listen to their low-power FM station, maybe in the car, where they have a better radio. Maybe at home, they don't even have a radio, but they know I can just immediately go to my computer, to my smartphone, to my smart speaker, et cetera, and tune in the station. And it, for them, it, it's the same as going from your, in, in, you know, maybe 15 years prior, going from your car, listening in a radio, coming in and turning on your radio in your house. And so it really allows, uh, you know, stations that, that due to finance and due to uh, the nature of their license, couldn't have large audiences to really, to really grow their influence and their connections, both to their local communities and the world. So Paul, I want to, I, I want to sort of step from this, uh, this uh, notion of being able to reach niche communities on a non-geographic basis uh, globally through some interesting challenges that I think we all watched very closely at the end of the 90s uh, as uh, music rights uh, started to uh, get a little bit challenged by what was happening. Uh, so just a very brief personal anecdote. I was quite involved with uh, changing mp3.com from a download and listen to a click and listen immediately by enabling it to stream essentially just at the end of uh, 98, 99. And um, at the time it was, it was for me uh, a real eye opener sitting uh, in the middle of this huge American.com popping uh, absolutely exploding just as Napster was starting to hit the floor and uh, all, of, all, all the great war between Metallica and the IRA and mp3.com and Napster was was exploding and of course that um, in some ways I think the music industry or the right side of the music industry kind of rolled over but I'm going to just jump back to you Rob for a minute because I know you've been involved in content distribution and all sorts of other models not just linear live streaming and so on and uh, I just wanted to talk to you about how you've seen how you've seen that uh, rights world evolve and how it's become more possible or more difficult I don't know over the years to put content online to see models emerging like Spotify like Rhapsody like these other bigger models that have emerged and whether you think the challenges are getting easier or harder well, I, I think it's, I, I break it into a few pieces. One of the reasons that radio worked in the early days 
was because uh, there were, generally speaking, rules as to if something was a stream, uh, you had much freer right to license it than if it was if it was a uh, like you're just playing a whole album or something. And so, uh, and that got codified uh, with the famous uh, DMCA in the United States, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which actually defined a radio station in terms of how many songs in a row you could play from one artist and you know how much skipping you could allow. And so there were all these sort of rules that kind of got uh, codified around that. Uh, I would say that it has been my experience, uh, having worked cl closely uh, with the music industry for um, uh, a number of years, is that in general, I would say the music industry resembles nothing more than a circular firing squad uh, in, in terms of how it works. Uh, you have all these different stakeholders that have very different views of how it should be. You've got the artists, of course, which are the font of the content. Uh, they often have managers. Uh, and then they have record companies that have, uh, the old model was the record companies would uh, sign them to a very uh, long-term contract that in success was very one-sided. The record companies were basically running like a portfolio thing where they were putting money out for a lot of artists and the ones that hit uh, were immensely profitable and they had commitments to make typically seven albums over seven years uh, and, uh, and pay a royalty that was uh, relatively small and fund a lot of uh, you could say ch uh, charitably funded a lot of other experimentation, certainly funded profits in the good years. So you have that relationship. And then in the, the song, you have both the composition of the song and the performance of the song. And you have these different groups that, that the songwriters get paid by the song and the performers pay the performing act. And uh, there's not an agreement as to uh, what the proper ratio of payment should be for those two. So you have all these different stakeholders. And what I experienced in trying to build commercial models that were voluntary. In other words, there are some models like radio that have a statutory framework, where as long as you follow the rules and you, you pay the ASCAPs and the BMIs and the other agencies appropriately, you can keep doing your thing. But when you get into where you need to have a voluntary negotiations, uh, it can, becomes very difficult. Now, over time, those models have solidified. And so uh, you've got services like uh, Rhapsody, Napster that we've been involved in for a long time. Uh, that are now, Napster started out as a pirate service. Rhapsody was always a legitimate service, but now uh, we own the Napster brand within the company that is Rhapsody. Uh, then you've got companies like Spotify that is probably the single biggest success story in terms of an independent company scaling up. And how they were able to do it actually is, you know, there's a, probably several chapters in uh, some of the books that are being written by, by folks on this panel. They were able to get much more flexible rights in Europe because the commercial Street music streaming services, on-demand services in Europe were tiny. There were probably about 100,000 subscribers across all of continental Europe, while there were over a million in the United States. So the record companies in Europe were more flexible, and Spotify came to them with a more aggressive proposition around a free product that consumers liked. Uh, and Spotify today was free to go to home and convert to paid, and we just made revenue too. And so Spotify got that business going in Europe in a way that no U.S. company could possibly do uh, because the, the, uh, the rights company, rights holders in the U.S. weren't going to go for that. Then as Spotify tried to come in the U.S. Famously, they were delayed for about two years until they kept putting more and more zeros on the checks and ultimately made about $100 million against uh, to its record label in exchange for getting rights that were closer to what they got in Europe and much, better, much more flexible rights than they had gotten before. So my, my version of the history of this is that the music industry, which is now doing better financially than it's done in a long time, could have uh, uh, gotten there much faster if the industry had been collaborative. And they could have gotten there in a, in a way that I think would have allowed many more experiments to bloom. But they were very much afraid of, of losing control. And as I said, all the different stakeholders had a hard time agreeing. So what we saw play out over really a 15 year period was a, was a, a Dar very Darwinian process. Many companies uh, went out of business. You mentioned mp3.com is an example of one. Uh, there are many, many others that tried to do things that they thought were uh, uh, pioneering uh, and either they weren't able to get sufficient rights to create a good product or they launched the product anyway without rights and like mp3.com got sued to oblivion. So it was a, uh, a wrenching process. I wish it had been different. Uh, but understanding the dynamics of the music industry, I understand why it played out the way it did. 
And Dane, you've got uh, you've got um, several hundred uh, commercial radio stations playing out on on through your CDN and so on. And obviously, you, you're probably in the role that most ISPs work as mere conduit. You, you you assume that the clients have rights; they they have to take responsibility. You do the bits and bytes delivery and so on. But um, how are you aware of how any of those uh, stations have dealt with rights and, and uh, the sort of licensing frameworks that have evolved over the last 15 years and so on that, that, uh, that you're seeing? Well, we mostly work in the UK territory, so a lot of it follows the framework that they have. Um, but we do know that there's like uh, some some rules around the amount of um, internet broadcasting stations you can have attached with an FM license, um, and uh, there's a the small scale DAB here as well. I think also comes with one um, one particular uh, internet stream as well. So um, as long as you're adhering to those rules, then it's generally okay in this country. Um, I know that John's platform, um, who I think is uh, part of the panel or uh, in, in, in the wings, He's lurking, yeah. um, lurking in the wings, Live 365, I know that those guys are also doing um, uh, licensing agreements directly with the PPL and PPI, um, which is effectively what the stations do, but they're doing it on, on their behalf. So um, there has been that kind of movement in the market, which I think sort of uh, gives people a bit more freedom to be able to try things and experiment um, without fear of uh, persecution for, you know, streaming content without right online. And Andrew, um, have you, would you say that the rights models have evolved sufficiently to uh, provide frameworks where uh, people can collaborate with musicians cooperatively or do you think that the that actually the that as rob's pointed out they've been kind of slow to evolve and actually there is a large pirate scene on the internet still no i mean i think i think rob gave a really really you know better breakdown of that than i even possibly could you know um but yeah you know i think i think if anything the the whole um the whole right situation with music particularly in the u.s is really kind of one of the great tragedies of internet radio and and podcasting too is that it's so so restrictive and there's many people who yeah there's certainly people who've you know i guess you could call them pirates people who've you know small broadcasters who've continued to go online without the rights and they are able to kind of fly under the radar or eventually maybe they get caught up um who tried to do some you know great music programming online but it's 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 quite cost prohibitive you know and it's one of these things where you know, the bigger you get, the more your royalty bill gets, and so you can't ever scale. Um, so it's it's a space that's dominated by these, you know, these massive platforms, um, you know, Apple and Spotify and them who can do streaming audio, um, you know, not necessarily radio, although they have radio-like features at least. And, um, and then you do have a few, I mean, Paul mentioned KXCP. I mean, there's a few success stories, um, but that's because they're they're big enough that they can negotiate directly with the artists. And, you know, NPR, All Things Considered, and a few other things, um, you know, KXLU, um, who are, you know, and they're sort of these indie, uh, you know, indie or, or nonprofit, you know, non-commercial stations that are able to do direct, um, you know, direct rights with artists. But that's, you know, that's time intensive and, and only, a f you know, it only works for, you know, a certain few big players um, there's a, a lot of small, you know, a lot of sort of niche music genres and things that, you know, are just hard to um, keep good streams going online. Uh, but again, I mean, Paul knows, uh, you know, knows the rights issues way better than I do. So that stuff makes my head spin after a while, <laughs> well, you know, like Rob described. It's interesting in, in the United States, there's, there's a hard one carve out for non-commercial radio stations. Yeah. So licensed radio stations, college, community, public radio stations, uh, religious stations, where they don't pay through the nose, essentially, uh, for the music rights in order to broadcast online. And it's great, but it's hard won. There's a lot of negotiation by the National Federation of Community Broadcasters, College Broadcasters Incorporated, and NPR with the rights holders to get that carve out. Left on the sideline are those little tiny uh, pure play internet broadcasters. Uh, uh, until 2016, there was a statute on the books United States, uh, the, web, the Small Webcaster Settlement Act, which made the rates to license music for 
a small webcaster, so somebody who's really not making much money at all, and came in on another number, a, a small number of total listening hours, got a relatively good deal. That deal expired because it was written into law by Congress, and it's never been renewed. And that's why around 2016, it was um, this great flattening out of independent internet radio in the U.S. because lots of stations decided they could no longer afford to exist because they were hobby projects, passion projects, not intended to be uh, not intended to be for profit. And I, and I do have to give a big shout out to John in Live 365 and its current incarnation because uh, they stepped in to try and figure it out and provide some reasonably priced packages to folks who want to be independent internet radio stations and cut through a lot of the morass of paperwork you need to figure out. Um, and, you know, they took a great legacy brand that had gone away, uh, Live 365, which at one time hosted tens of thousands of little, uh, you know, independent radio stations and was able to, to bring it back in the last in the last few years. But, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure John could talk about, you know, I'm sure that wasn't an easy feat and required <laughs> a lot of both, uh, uh, you know, clever spreadsheeting along with uh, lawyers involved in order to make make this possible. But, you know, it's it's not the same still as it was prior to uh, 2016. Unfortunately, if you want to start just your own little independent internet radio station, not attached to a broadcast station or not with a lot of capital. I think it's, I think it's interesting that one of the, the um, things that's always surprised me about internet radio is a lot of the technology has, has uh, done something very simple, very well, and it actually hasn't uh, evolved with the ferocity the, uh, the 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 video spaces you know I, I, we we my, my company works with video an awful lot and every six months somebody's trying to completely change the entire ecosystem because they've got a new bell and a whistle that they want to add in whereas really the one thing that's um, sort of come to maturity in my mind in the last five five or ten years has been the ad insertion model in internet audio I think that has started to mature you've seen ads with and Pandora and um, uh, forgive me, I forget the name, Triton and uh, their, their platform. Uh, uh, you know, there's a few platforms which have emerged to help with the monetization, but actually they're really still based on, on some of the Icecast and Shoutcast technologies which have been um, holding forth for, um, you know, really, really for 15 years or so. So, um, I, I, you know, with, with that look, we should just touch in the last couple of minutes, um, as, as uh, we have got a couple of questions in on the Q&A, so but it'd be interesting just to touch for the last couple of minutes just to have an idea from each of you where you think the future lies over the next uh, over the next five years and so on does anyone want to step forward and take that question first well i'll just start in the context of what we're doing now because it's i'm impressed that we're 15 minutes in and the topic of the pandemic hasn't come up so we're <laughs> we're having this conversation it's refreshing actually because it comes up usually in the first 30 seconds of almost any conversation nowadays we're having this conversation in a context where uh, uh, something unimaginable that hadn't happened in a century has happened and a, uh, a new virus that is uh, 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 quite serious and often lethal uh, has forced us all to come inside. And so what, what's happened is the connectivity technology, the way we're doing this now with Zoom, uh, internet uh, streaming, uh, 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 the whole set of technologies have now become such a central and essential uh, part of everyone's lives that uh, I think it's a one-way door, which is to say uh, there's going to be a period for the next year, year and a half, where we're going to have to do things differently because of the pandemic. Then after that, there'll be a period where this uh, particular virus has a vaccine and treatment, and we, we, we are no more concerned about it than we are about a flu or uh, other uh, things that we deal with as persistent challenges, but but not structural challenges. Uh, and but we'll have changed. We'll have done this thing we're living uh, in a much more digital, vir a virtual way than we ever have before. And I think that's going to have profound impact on uh, internet streaming. It's going to have a profound impact on social connectivity. Uh, it's very hard to foresee all of the impacts, but it feels to me like a one-way door. Perfect. Any other thoughts, guys? I'll jump in. Um, you know, I, I think that effectively, you know, radio is audio and that's shared. And I think that internet radio such as it is and podcasting are definitely, you know, merging together. 
right? Folks don't make so much of a distinction between Netflix and television any longer, right? It's all TV. Peak TV isn't only about AMC or NBC, right? It also is Amazon Prime Video. And I think ultimately that's where we're going with radio, as we call it. And we will, and I think we are, we, we, we have the opportunity here for there to be peak radio. Podcasting drove a lot of innovation by allowing folks who wanted to do at least talk program and storytelling programming to break free from the very restrictive chains of of commercial and public broadcasters and experiment and try new things and, and really succeed. And we're seeing the technologies for podcasting, you know, frankly, moving closer to streaming in terms of, you know, even on the monetization side, ad insertion is now very prominent in podcasting where ads are being put in to episodes as you download them rather than them living live in an episode forever, right? And a lot of the same technology you say with Triton is being is being implemented for for podcasting. And that same way, you know, podcasting, you know, forced some innovation in radio. Uh, both in commercial radio and public radio and in, in, in non-commercial radio, which which is sort of interesting where you have like the New York Times, the daily podcast is now also a daily radio show. Mm-hmm. But it you know, it's important, you know, which is certain on public radio stations around the country, but it's important that it started in podcasting where there were fewer restrictions, fewer constraints along many different vectors. Uh, and only through that success did it sort of push its way into radio. So you could listen to it on demand every morning when it comes on uh, into your, you know, feed on your podcast app, or you could listen to, to the live feed on your local public radio station or some other public radio station across the country, you know, either through the terrestrial airwaves or uh, on your, your, your listening app on your phone, you know, and I think even if you look at the BBC, like iPlayer really kind of mixes between, you can listen to things on demand from a week ago, you can listen to things that are live. And so that line between a podcast on demand and live is really being, is really being stretched and, and each has its benefits. There's great things about live radio. There's great things about on-demand radio. And ultimately, I think for listeners, when it's wonderful when you don't have to choose. When you can say, hey, I love that radio show that's on at 10 o'clock at night, but it just doesn't fit with my schedule. I'd love to go back and listen to it again. And, and then you can. Um, or, you know, there's all these programs that can't make it onto a radio station for all sorts of reasons. And I can still listen to it. And I think that's the merger that we're seeing uh, much more so right now. Okay, Dane, uh, any big disruptors on your horizon? Um, I think there's a vast majority of the UK and European market that are still on ICY um, protocol and I can see that sort of changing and, and, and moving more towards a commoditized HLS environment so that um, you know everything is, is just very accessible um, but yeah otherwise I wouldn't say uh, it, it would be nice to see the advertising model disrupted a little more I think um, I think there's a few very big players at the top there that have a lot of power. It'd be good just to sort of split some of that. Um, but uh, yeah, you've mentioned yeah. and you, you've you've mentioned to me that uh, you've seen an enormous explosion in smart speaker and in car entertainment, uh, but particularly smart speaker use in the last few years. Yeah, I think um, in the last three four years we've seen sort of sixty percent of our streams shoot from um, mobile. Uh, what was mobile onto onto smart speakers in this market predominantly alexas i think because they were here first um mm-hmm. but that is a, a massive trend change and obviously all the publishers are now integrating with um the various skills and things as well which is i think uh another almost essential for a budding radio station um or big enterprise station they have to be integrated up at that smart speaker level to catch the uh, the next wave of audience and I've got one great question which has come in on the Q&A and I'd like a short answer from each of you to uh, help us wrap this up. I, I really like this question. Do you think internet radio, and this is from uh, Gene Johnson, so do you think internet radio was something that anyone thought was going to be a thing 30 years ago? So that's, uh, that's uh, 1989. So anyone, anyone got any thoughts on that one? Maybe Andrew. I mean, probably not, because I mean, if you go to 1989, I don't think too many people even really fathom what the internet was just yet. Um, I mean, outside of, you know, technology inclined people, but um, you don't know, I, I would say probably not. I mean, I think, and if, if you were to talk about radio, uh, people in the radio industry saw internet radio, you know, particularly the commercial radio industry in the, in the US, saw internet radio as competition to a large degree. Um, they didn't really want it to happen um, early on, uh, many, many people didn't. Um, 
So I can see I Paul nodding it. fiercely there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but what I think, you know, just to, to, to think about it, the one thing that's exciting about not, you know, knowing, I would almost say I have no clue what the future is going to be, but I think what I love about radio as a medium and internet radio, you know, in this context is how accessible it is, right? The reason why streaming started with radio has as much to do with the fact that it was just voice early on and that was the easiest thing to transmit. It was almost an accident that radio was really the birth of streaming media. But that's the thing that I think, you know, if in this moment, right, there's lots of things we could talk about with the technology or the economics of, of internet radio and podcasting, and that's certainly changing. But what I think is exciting is that radio is a great place for people who want to get something out to an audience, who have something to say. Radio still remains, and internet radio and podcasting remain quite accessible. Um, and so it's really, I think it's just exciting to see what do the people want to make of it. And if you want to get, and it's still a great place to start if you want to do some sort of you know, program, it's easier to do than video. Um, you can go deeper than you can with like social media. So, you know, I, I think radio, I love how radio always ends up being, you know, it kind of renewing itself, you know, every, you know, 15, 20, 30 years. When one group moves on, a new group moves in and that's what keeps radio so exciting. <laughs> and Rob, did you uh, did you have any uh, prescience in 1989 that you didn't admit to? <laughs> uh, I would say that I know people who were that prescient. Like uh, Mitch Caper, the founder of Lotus, was an incredibly forward-thinking person. Always like was thinking about stuff three years before anybody else I knew was. So probably Mitch was thinking about it 30 years ago. What I was thinking about 30 years ago, which may have some resonance, is I was very frustrated by the online world. I was. I've made products that used online services like AOL and CompuServe and Prodigy, and these are all US services, some of them were global. And uh, they were all separate islands. And I remember thinking how stupid it is if you're trying to have connectivity um, th to have all these different islands. And I was involved in networking software where we were trying to do networking from within enterprises. And then ultimately when you have an enterprise network, how do you connect it up? So there was sort of, you had to imagine a world where all that stuff just became dial tone, where all that stuff became like the interstate uh, highway system, where everything connected to everything. And once you had that fabric, and that was the genius of Tim Berners-Lee, who I think still doesn't get enough credit for everything he invented, and that was the genius of the people who created TCIP, TCP IP before them, uh, that there was this underlying infrastructure that ultimately generalized and scaled beautifully to connect 7 billion people theoretically, and in practice probably three or four billion people on the planet. So it's a show that it shows that sort of, oftentimes you can't envision something because there's a, a precursor thing that hasn't been invented or hasn't been realized yet. So that's to me is a lesson of, you know, once you create an underlying fabric like that, it's kind of magical. Perfect. Well, listen, I really wish we had a two hour session and we could switch on this hour from the history of Internet Radio to the future of Internet Radio and do another hour because this panel's awesome. But I think at this point, it leaves, it's, uh, it's, it's best if I just quickly buzz along the panelists and say thank you to each of you. So, Dane, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. You. And uh, I'm going to try and click the spotlight button fast enough. Paul, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's been wonderful, Rob. Thank you very much for diving in from the far Great. side of uh, the States. It's been brilliant to have you. And Andrew, I look forward to uh, reading your book in some depth and sharing more notes in the future. And with okay, that, you. you've had uh, me, Don Robinson, um, from uh, Streamer Media and uh, from Ideas, hosting this panel on the history of internet radio. And I'm going to hand back to Philip, I think, uh, from Live365. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Dom, and thanks to everyone. Really awesome panel. I really appreciate everyone's time today, for sure. All okay. right, I have stopped the recording. Hey, thanks, everyone. That was great. Uh, I think we did hit as many of the Q&As Q as we could, and we're ready to move on to the next panel. So thanks. I appreciate it. That thank was you. great. Thank you. Perfect. Fantastic. Yeah, Speak absolutely. to you soon, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Speak to you soon. Thanks again, guys. Bye, See you, folks. Take care.